is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Today's episode is thanks to our Patreon members and our affiliates and partners. Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to join our membership or donate to the podcast and stay tuned to hear about some amazing deals and discounts from our partners, including Prevenix, Inside Tracker, Orgain, Practice Better, and Jen and Carrie. But for now, we're getting right to the show. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, and I'm here today with another registered sports dietitian and certified specialist in sports dietetics. Her name is Heidi Strickler. Heidi got her master's in sports nutrition from Liverpool John Moores University in England. Heidi has been practicing as a registered dietitian for almost 10 years and finally launched her virtual private practice, Heidi Strickler Nutrition LLC, in January of 2020. In her practice, Heidi specializes in endurance athletes, female-bodied athletes and the menstrual cycle, plant-based athletes, and athletes with eating disorders, disordered eating, red S, and amenorrhea. As you can already tell, we have a lot in common, so I'm super excited to talk with her. A little bit more about Heidi. Heidi brings both nutrition science and her personal story as an athlete with an eating disorder into her work with her clients and into the presentations that she gives globally to athletes, coaches, parents, dietitians, and medical professionals. Heidi is extremely passionate about changing the language, beliefs, and culture of sport with the hopes of preventing athletes from the physical and emotional trauma she battled for 12 years. The way of doing this, she believes, is honest conversation and constant education. Heidi, based in Seattle, is also an athlete herself, competing collegiately, semi-professionally, and internationally. While trail and ultra running is her true passion, she considers herself an outdoor endurance junkie and explores the Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountains via climbing, skiing, cycling, snowshoe running, open water swimming, backpacking, almost always with her dog, Sophie. Heidi also says she doesn't go a day without coffee, chocolate, or peanut butter. We talk about all these things and more in this conversation, so I'm excited for you to listen. Heidi, welcome to the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. It's great to be here. We're excited to have a have a conversation face to face. Well, face to face ish. Yes, face to face ish. The closest we can get because you are living in the Pacific Northwest. Yes, correct? yes, yeah. Seattle. Seattle. Yeah, and you've kind of been your fr- kind of grew up in in that region or Utah was it? Yeah, yeah. I grew okay. up in Utah and then moved up here for college for the first time in two thousand eight, and then have left and come back a handful of times, but probably back here for good. Yeah. Well, both areas, Utah, Washington, just, I think are, I've just visited both. I've never lived in either, but I think for outdoor adventure, active people like yourself, yes. people tend to love it for those reasons, right? Yeah, definitely a little bit of a, a little bit of a Mecca for sure. Yeah. I lived in Illinois for my dietetic internship for a year, central Illinois and Peoria, and it was the first time I'd ever lived somewhere where there weren't mountains. And the first time I realized that I could not ever do that again. <laughs> it was beautiful in its own way. But yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I, the mountains are like a 10 minute drive. So yeah, yeah. Pretty good. I love that. Well, awesome. Well, I absolutely love talking to other dietitians other sports dietitians, And you and I have so many professional similarities in our passions and the work that we do, specifically working with athletes who might struggle with disordered eating or red S. So super excited to just like have a 
I just a conversation with you. And yeah. and so to to start, you are very open about your own personal journey as a female athlete and one that struggled with disordered eating and that kind of, you know, really contributes to your work and your passion for helping others as well. But I I just if you don't mind me backtracking a little bit, did your struggles with nutrition start before or after deciding to study it? That's a great question. I think, I mean, both Both. from the standpoint of, I think when I was younger, you know, I grew up with, you know, the the whole weight, like a weight watchers, you know, moms are on diets. So I think when I was in high school, I was aware of my body and that maybe, and I I mean, I was never like, I've always been in a a privileged body, Mm -hmm. but I probably didn't fit like the thin ideal you know, of the magazines. This is just not the natural shape of my body. Like I am just like straight on the sides. I don't have a waist. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think I grew up being aware of my body, but there's never any food involved. And then I did, it was wild. I did come across a, like a journal entry from, or a new year's resolution entry from middle school resolving to lose weight, which was like pretty jarring. To realize that like at that age, I was already like wrapped up in that. To that's what I should resolve to do. Mm-hmm. And then I went to college and I think there was a little bit more talk around like earning food. I played soccer collegiately. And so there's a little bit of, you know, more talk around that, you know, fear of, you know, gaining the freshman 15, etc. Yeah. And so that was the first time I tangibly remember counting calories. And I actually didn't plan on studying nutrition. I planned on studying physical therapy, but the school I went to didn't have a physical therapy degree. So it was just going to be a human bio degree. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up switching or considering looking at nutrition in sports nutrition, kind of the end of my freshman year, took my first nutrition class and I was sold. And it was kind of like, you know, some of those seeds were already planted. And then in the era that I was an undergrad, I mean, it was all about weight loss. And so, you know, I really learned how to have an eating disorder and like manipulate nutrition to lose weight and that kind of thing. And then, yeah, it kind of just ebbed and flowed from there until it really tanked. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I just find it fascinating because I absolutely love our profession and definitely want to advocate for people who want to study nutrition, become registered dietitians. But it does, if any part of you is maybe like seeds, like you said, seeds are planted of being somewhat on that disordered side or something like sometimes getting a degree in it just makes it worse. And and I, yeah. you know, I guess I'm not super, I think in the curriculum nowadays, just some people I've talked to, things might be getting a little bit better, but it's still like the curriculum is still medical nutrition therapy. And then what are those situations? It's, you know, kidney disease, renal failure, and, and, yeah, just weight loss tends to be the, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's the solution for any of those things, but it's just like, that's what it is in the nutrition books. And it definitely, yeah. Yeah. So like you said, it, it, you became very good at manipulating your own diet then, because I think it's also in our nature as somebody who's interested in science, we'll just say to kind of self-experiment. Oh, a hundred percent. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that idea of, which like you said, you know, I think it's getting a little bit better, but still like obesity is the reason for all of these chronic diseases. And the way that you will get better is by losing weight. Like just that is the, that's what I learned. And I think that still is much of what's taught today in many spaces, which yeah, it's just ugh, makes me nauseous. You, you know what? I had a, a thought this morning. I went to the doctors this morning for myself because I'm having terrible foot pain. And I was like, Ooh. I got to get ahead of this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I So the reason I went to the doctor was hopeful to get a referral for an orthopedic or something. But anyways, on the little handout they had me fill out, there was just a question literally that said, are you interested in weight loss? Yes or no? And there was no follow up oh to God. it. Yeah. So there was like, there was a mental health screening. I was happy about that, you know, and then it's just like, you know, age, date of birth, why are you here for the visit, mental health screening, and are you interested in weight loss? Yes or no? I, so I put no. I didn't have the energy or oomph in me today to, <laughs> to walk into the doctor's yeah. office yeah. and fight it. But like, yeah, it's just this thing of like, it's just out there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, Weird. yeah, it's gross. Yeah. I was actually had the opposite experience from the standpoint of I went, I found a new 
primary care physician this past year and went to the office for a follow up. Forget what, why I was going in, some follow up appointment. And they first asked me if I was okay being weighed. So wonderful. And then if I wanted to turn around. Wow. Like just, yeah, I, I've been very pleased with that. That's awesome. Definitely. Yeah, yes. that's definitely not the norm as far as doctor's office visits go right now, but that's great to hear. But it's not the norm, unfortunately. No, no. There's a lot of harm caused in the medical system. Yeah, yeah. And so great to hear that some places are are making changes. Awesome. So it's so... Like you said, like you, you know, you were an athlete, you played soccer in college, you wanted to be a physical, maybe physical therapy, got into nutrition, fell for it. But then because of what you were learning, kind of started implementing changes to your diet to lose weight, whether or not you needed to, or, or should have. And at what point did you recognize or agree to admit, or how did it come about that? Like, this is an eating disorder. Oh, it was years. Yeah. Over 10 years. You know, I, so I, you know, played, I went to to university on a soccer scholarship and then ended up switching to track and cross country after my junior fall soccer season, got wrapped up in the, the running world. And again, like in the world of nutrition and in the world of running, everything I was doing was celebrated and normalized, right? Like I was yeah. eating, you know, eating healthy in quotes and I lost my period when I went to college and this, you know, was seen as I was fit enough. I was training hard enough. It was this badge of honor. The book Racing Weight was published when I was in college. Oh, yeah. And, you know, my coaches, like, they were great in terms of, you know, well, maybe, maybe not as much. (laughs) (laughs) Long pause as you're thinking about this. They... I had no idea what I had never run. It's like I got into running in college, actually in a kind of disordered way from the standpoint of like, at first I enjoyed it, but then it became a way to like burn calories when I like wasn't playing. And anyway, but did find I loved it. Switching to track cross country was naturally just very good. But I looked up to like these coaches and teammates who coached people, you know, weren't great role models from the standpoint of what it meant to like, eat adequately as a female bodied runner. So again, I like, I truly didn't think I had an issue. You know, I had people back home who expressed concern about my body changing, but you know, I think as I'm sure you also agree, like that is, you know, telling me, Oh, you've lost weight. We're worried. Like that's the worst thing to say, you know, they obviously meant well, yeah, but that's, that's what my that's what I was going for. And so to hear that I was like, Oh, great, I'm doing the right thing. I'm just gonna keep on keep on keeping on. Yeah. You were get to in your brain at the time it was positive reinforcement. Yes. Yeah. What I'm doing is working. Yes. yes, exactly. So so yeah, I really like totally thought that what I was doing was okay and just what it took. I felt like I had this pressure of like walking the talk again in quotes as a dietitian once I kind of moved actually into my career and being like, Oh, well, this is what people assume dietitians eat. And so this is what I need to eat. And I was running really well post collegiately and getting to be like pretty competitive at kind of more elite levels. And, you know, people, you know, off the street, you know, comment on my body. So again, just like all these positive reinforcements. And I definitely, you know, I think there was some overall just like restriction, but it was definitely more that orthorexia, like that term was not around when I was in my twenties, but that is definitely what it was that, you know, obsession with healthy eating I developed, you know, intermittent fasting stuff. I, you know, went, you know, ended up getting more restrictive in terms of like, oh, I'm going to not eat meat for environmental reasons. But then it was, you know, the removal of dairy and then I was vegan. And then I had so many stomach issues probably because I wasn't eating enough food. It's not nourished. I assumed, yeah, I assumed I was like, oh, I'm lactose intolerant and you can't do dairy. Oh, I'm gluten sensitive. I can't do gluten. And so, you know, jumped on a lot of the bandwagons and you know, it really wasn't until I moved to England for my master's degree that that many years of restriction kind of swung the other way. And I started binging Mm. and really kind of started to recognize that I, my relationship with food had gotten really twisted. Oh, can I pause you there? What a, what a, sorry, my mommy brain might not have all the words that I want to express, but what like, (laughs) 
what a um, societal issue in how mm-hmm. we perceive eating disorders that restriction gets praised, but oh my gosh, once I started binging, there must be a problem. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and that's why I think there's so much, I will say all eating disorders need and deserve help. And one is not mm-hmm. better or right. anything than the other, but I think people who experience the binging experience a lot more shame for sure because yeah, more on the, the outside perspective or public eye that is not correct, but other people praise that, Oh, you look fit and healthier or you, Oh, you have good control over your diet. And so when we suddenly start binging, then there's so much, unfortunately shame with that. And, and, and it's so unfortunate, but it's very telling, I think of, of why this goes on for so long sometimes. So that started and my body did start to change. And so I started finding ways to get my body back. I definitely had, you know, from the time of my twenties, I became really obsessive with like weighing myself and, you know, counting calories and just, you know, various forms of, you know, how much can I control, you know, my body and my food. And so when I was living in England, you know, that, you know, kind of started the binging and then also, you know, laxatives and purging and things like that and moved back to the States and it didn't get any better. And I kind of had a moment where, I mean, it definitely developed over time, but this point where I, I was so afraid of myself and to be by myself anywhere, whether that was home or a coffee shop or the grocery store or a restaurant or somebody else's house, like I was so (laughs) out of control in these like binge purge cycles. And it was like, yeah, terrifying and definitely kind of that rock bottom. And I remember telling my ex-husband that if I, you know, couldn't get myself out of these these behaviors over, I can't remember exactly, you know, amount of time or whatever that I needed to go to treatment. This was early 2020. And then everything shut down. (laughs) Oh, God. And ended up with a a fracture in my fibula that I got from running. And I mean, I think I definitely, I feel really grateful and I don't know how or why I was able to do this, but I do feel really grateful that I did have enough nutrition knowledge and enough motivation to get better that I kind of just told my ex, I was like, okay, we are quarantined. Like I need you, like I cannot be alone. Like I, at that point, like I just knew that I needed to break those neural pathways. Yeah. And if I could stop those daily habits, then I could like start to just like re-nourish myself. And it worked over the course of the first couple months of quarantine. I totally got myself out of like my binge purge cycles, but it came to midsummer and I still knew that while those behaviors were gone, I couldn't get myself to eat as much as I knew I needed to on my own. I hadn't had a period for. 10 years at this point and I knew how bad that was you know I was specializing in female bodied athletes and menstrual cycles and again I think there was one of the reasons it took me so long to get help is I did have so much shame as a dietitian having an eating disorder I was like I'm a fake I'm a fraud no one is going to trust me I just felt so yeah so much shame on top of just the shame that somebody would already feel yeah so yeah then I, I ended up going to treatment in the fall of 2020 Amazing. And yeah, it was the hardest and best decision I've ever made for myself. I'm so, so. glad you've got me yeah. almost in tears over here <laughs> because I just really feel for you as a dietitian. We, there's so many pressures that anybody can feel in their career, you know, that just to uphold their professionalism or, you know, and, and it just, it, it doesn't speak it like I don't know it does speak to you as a dietitian in the sense that you know so much and mm-hmm. you know about nutrition and it doesn't but what you went through or what you did for yourself doesn't mean you know your role with somebody else necessarily at the same time when you go through things personally it actually can help you in your future career right mm-hmm. or in which is what you like why you're so passionate about this because you have lived it yeah yeah you have definitely. lived it but yeah, I, I really feel for you, you know, 2020 and prior, how you must have been feeling. It's just hard. I've, I've met, I had a, a girl in one back when I was in school 
that unfortunately had to stop being a dietitian because of her eating disorder. It was too challenging to do both. And, and I, Frank, at the end of the day, I'm like, that is what's best for her. Like, screw the career. Oh, Go live yeah. your life, yes. you know? Yeah be healthy. But I do. Exactly. Exactly. But I really felt for her because she, you know, got a degree and a master's degree and she spent like, you know, how many years and hours and money Mm -hmm. dedicating herself to this. And then unfortunately, I think continuing to dedicate herself to that career continued her eating disorder longer for all the reasons you and I just talked about. Yeah. I had a friend and I've had this, I've had people ask me this question especially since like I made it public that I had struggled with an eating disorder and I've kind of steered my career more towards, you know, working with athletes with res and disorder eating disorders. But I've, I've had people ask me, you know, how I can like be in recovery and be exposed mm-hmm. to this all the time. And I never was really able to put words to it. And then I was talking to a friend this past winter. Yeah. This past winter back in Utah. And she asked me the same question and I, was able to actually kind of put into words the idea of like, when I work with eating disorders every day, I mean, I see the worst of the worst of disordered eating eating disorders, both what it does to the physical and mental health of of athletes. And so nothing makes me want to have an eating disorder less than (laughs) seeing that every day. Like, um, you know, having that reminder of just the aloneness and the misery and the feelings of being out of control or being controlled. And despite, you know, some of those other safety components. And then also, you know, I like, I think it's always, it's good. You know, I do challenge meals with my athletes virtually and in person. And I love that. And also just like keeps me in check. There was one day where three Three calls in a row, I had challenge meals and all three athletes chose to do pancakes or waffles. And so over the course of three hours, because I also like, I show them my plate, I eat it like what would be an appropriate portion for me. Yeah. So (laughs) the pancakes and waffles I had over the course of three hours was a lot. (laughs) And there's no way I would have been able to do that with an eating disorder. Right, right. I love that. Yeah. Hey fans, I hope you are enjoying this conversation so far and we'll be back to it in just a moment. But first, I want to pause and let you know that this episode is brought to you by the Female Athlete System of Transformation, aka the fast track to overcome disordered eating and use food as fuel to perform at your highest level. The Female Athlete System of Transformation is my unique program and proven systems to guide female athletes to understanding and implementing the proper nutrition for their sport, life, and health. Myself and my team of registered sports dietitians work one-on-one with clients to address their unique needs and counsel them through the nutritional and behavioral changes needed. Many female athletes who resonate with disordered eating, mental guilt around food and body, relative energy deficiency in sport or female athlete triad, amenorrhea, repeat injuries due to negligent nutrition, or frankly, just a lack of knowledge and understanding on their fueling needs have seen incredible success in the fast track. After years of working as a sports RD, I've compiled the most effective ways for female athletes to learn nutrition, be supported, be challenged, and ultimately find their success with fueling as fast as possible. So don't wait another day. Get to your goals faster by joining the Female Athlete System of Transformation. Look in the show notes or head to the website to book a free call and learn more. Okay, now let's get you back to the conversation. Enjoy. Yeah, it's like, okay, working in it could be triggering or it can hold you accountable. And for you, it's holding you accountable. I definitely feel the same in my journey as well with the clients I work with that like, I, I want to be an inspiration. I want to, I want to show them by example. Right. And so like, same thing of like, if we're talking and, and I give a challenge of go eat this or that, like, I'm going to do it too. Yeah. Or I might turn it on myself and be like, you know, that's not what I need, but what I need, what I haven't eaten in a while, what I was questioning yeah. and, you know, post pictures of it and share it. And Mm -hmm. it really, in my, my situation though, different than yours, I can truly honestly, from the bottom of my heart say, since starting Rise Up Nutrition, my relationship with food has improved like tenfold. For sure. And my relationship with my body has improved tenfold because now I'm not just doing it for me. I'm doing it for 
clients as well. And I think same for you. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think my, and I try to also like be vocal about this on social media and with my athletes is, you know, yeah, I think like my, and like life is just more enjoyable. Like, and that's one of the things like I sometimes just wish that I could get my athletes to understand is just like the mental relief that you experience when you're not anxious about food all the time. It's, it's like, you don't know how loud your head is until it's not loud anymore. Mm -hmm. And just like the relational component and being able to like go out and eat enjoyable food with other people. And Mm -hmm. like, it's just like, it sounds so corny and cheesy, but like the freedom, like I would not, I would not take my like, any semblance of like my previous body back. And if it like, I wouldn't take any part of that body back when it came with like all of the food stuff and the mental and mental and psychological stuff and just the exhaustion. And I think for me, for sure, the, I think the body image and body comfort piece is probably the thing that's still the hardest. I, you know, I, you know, really don't have any issues with like, you know, food or, I've really worked on my relationship with exercise and movement a ton and that feels really good and balanced and yeah, my relationship with food feels really good. And, but like, I still have body struggles and I can definitely say that like, I also recognize I'm in a very privileged body. People look at me off the street and I, you know, still like I'm in a straight sized body, but you know, I think those roots and seeds are still in there that I grew up with about like what body should look like and what the female body ideal looks like and what the runner ideal looks like. And, you know, my stomach is like the least, my like the part of my body they've always been the least comfortable with. And when I was in my eating disorder and had like, you know, a six pack and people would comment on it, like that was a part of my body that I was most proud of. Right. Actually got a tattoo a couple months ago, like an eating disorder recovery tattoo. And one of the components of it is I got like beauty written on my stomach. So that when I look in the mirror, like I can remember that I'm beautiful. I love that. And I love that you did it, uh, you know, on that spot that is some insecurity for you. I think that's yeah. a really, you know, anybody who's into tattoos, I think that's a really good yes. idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am very into that. I have a lot of them. But, but yeah, so I think like the body piece is something that is still hard for me and it definitely goes in waves. And I also try and be really transparent about that. Of Like recovery for me, I think recovery looks different for everybody. Just like everybody's eating disorder is very different or disordered eating or relationship with food or whatever. And I try to be transparent and say like, for me, eating disorder recovery does not mean loving my body every day, but eating disorder recovery for me means even on those hard days when I may not like how my body looks or I might wish I had a six pack again. It doesn't impact my relationship with exercise or food. Yes. I love, yeah. I think that's so important to remember of, yeah, I definitely think that a lot of people will resonate with the fact that the body image is more of the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And that we can very often like feel that we're recovered in the sense of, you know, my behaviors Mm -hmm. aren't, you know, aren't changing and aren't wavering. And even if we still have those thoughts and insecurities or doubts about our body, I think that really says a lot in your journey of recovery. That when you say that I'm not going to change my behaviors, I'm not yeah. going to go back to the old ways. I think that's, I think that's a huge point. Like, cause again, when is recovered, that's really only for you to decide. But I think it's a huge point in recovery when you can confidently say like, I might have that thought, I might have that insecurity, but I'm not going to let it change my choices around food or Mm -hmm. my behaviors moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even like recognizing that even if I wake up one, even things like tracking my cycle and knowing like I'm more bloated during these times and more emotional. So of course, during this part of my cycle, like I'm going to feel less good about my body. And that on those days when I am more self-conscious, my people love me the same. Like they give zero shits about what my body looks like. And like my value to them has nothing to do with that. And then just like my ability to be out in the mountains, I think one of the things that really hit home for me, kind of that helped me go to treatment was I listened to an interview of Amelia Boone and she talked about, you know, with her eating disorder kind of journey as well and, and recovery 
that she she was so caught up in looking like an athlete that she couldn't actually be one because she could never get to the start line because she was so injured. Yeah. And so I think for me too, like that is that is the the goal and like one of the gems that I still hold of like I don't want to look like an athlete. I would like to be one. Be an athlete. Oh, that's so powerful, Heidi. Yeah. And I think, you know, and we were talking about this a little bit before we pressed record, but I think that's also been, <laughs> it's been like one of the most frustrating, disheartening pieces of eating disorder recovery for me is, you know, I think you kind of go into treatment or like I went into treatment and Amelia and I have talked about this, like you go into treatment, having had these injuries, knowing your body is broken, what you've done to it. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to eat all the, like eat all the food. I'm going to get my period back. and I'm not going to have injuries anymore. And I'm like three years post treatment and I've had nonstop injuries for the last three years. And it's just like this. And I have to reflect back and remind myself of like, I didn't like I've used my body for 12 years and you know early on yes like it was maybe a little bit more just like disordered eating versus like full blown eating disorder but I didn't have a period and like I still like I wasn't I was a lower weight than my natural body should be even though Mm -hmm. I looked like a lot of people I was competing against like my body was not meant to be that size and so three years of eating enough and having a period doesn't undo 12 years of that but like that's Hard. And that's su- that's such a hard yeah it's it's hard to accept because it's like you're doing so well for yourself right now you're doing so freaking well and yet you feel like you're being punished and so, you know yeah it's like why am I being punished for doing the right thing yeah yeah <laughs> and so you know to have these I have rules for myself like just to keep myself like in a recovery oriented place whether it's regardless of what time I'm training in the morning like I eat before you know, I eat immediately after, like I have some like dessert or sweet, like every day I, you know, have a like carbohydrate degree and starch with like all my meals and snacks. Like those were, those were things that, that were very disordered for me, like that I didn't do. And it can just feel just really like, yeah, you know, disheartening and defeating to know that I'm doing all these things and I have a normal cycle and it still isn't enough. And it's kind of that question of, well, when is it going to be enough? Mm Mm-hmm. And that just requires trust. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Trust in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And so kind of that, oh, I don't want to look like an athlete. I want to be an athlete. Mm-hmm. And even just like redefining what an athlete means to me. Whereas I think in my 20s, my value was so wrapped up in competing and winning mm-hmm. that that's what I thought. That's why I thought people loved me was because I was a good athlete and I won or I would always be on the podium. And so I put the pressure on myself to do that. And so running really became a way of like earning love Mm. and racing. And I think, you know, I've always been a competitive person. I'm still, you know, competitive. It's definitely changed. But, you know, I had jumped in a local like 20 mile race this past fall. And I had no business jumping in a 20 mile race. I had not been training. I had yeah. recently done like a big mountaineer climb in South America. i had been, been doing some snowshoe racing, but no long distance running. I had done some time on feet, but I had two friends who were doing it. And I was like, what the heck? I'm going to jump in the race. It's local. It'll be fun to race. And it's an easy race to drop. So like if I need to drop, I can, but let's just see what I can do. Mm -hmm. And I think coming back from eating disorder treatment, I always had this vision of like, I'm going to leave treatment and I'm going to race competitively again. And I'm going to win and prove that you can still win in a recovered body. Mm -hmm. And that was like always this like goal, I think that I had in mind. And then I was in the middle of this race and, you know, was in like the top three, four, kind of through the first half of the race, turned around was leapfrogging with kind of some of the top couple women. My friend Ladia Albertson Jenkins, she was also also in a race and she was like she's a pro runner and is incredibly fast and she was yeah, way ahead yeah. of every other every other woman in the race. Yeah. But kind of two through five were like leapfrogging each other. And then I got to a place where I was like, okay, if I keep trying to push, like I am not gonna be able to finish this race. I need to run my own race. And I had this really cool realization that like I I can run 
just to run. I don't actually have to race. And I can race just to be an experience and not to win. And it also doesn't change my value. It doesn't change how much, again, like my people love me. And so I think that was like going into having my first race back from treatment, my trail, first trail race back from treatment being something that I, I had no business racing Yeah, was really a, the best scenario. It. Cause I think it really helped me to have this realization of like, even just redefining what it means for me to be a trail runner. Whereas trail running for me had always, I mean, I grew up in the mountains. Mountains are truly like where I find the most joy and I love moving through them, whether it's like rock climbing or mountain biking or, you know, all, like, skiing, running, all these different things. I find so much joy in that. I think so much of my eating disorder took away that joy where I was running to keep my body, you know, a certain size or earn the love of people versus just running because it makes me happy. And so I think that was a really, really good experience. And even now, you know, when I'm out there, it's, I just feel, I feel so good like from a standpoint of like fueled and like strong, Mm -hmm. like compared to when I would be like running and racing prior where I just always felt like overstretched, you know, I'm like just the verge of like bonking or being out of gas. And like, I couldn't climb up hills, whether it was on a bike or, you know, on my feet running. So yeah, it's just also been kind of that one. I think there, there is a lot of that joy like oh like this is what it feels like to move in a well-fueled body like yeah wow like this is cool and it does feel good doesn't it oh my god like it's mind-blowing yeah like game like totally different because I think that I think as athletes there's a a level of suffering that we Mm -hmm. one expect to enjoy but like and glorify and, and three glorify yeah but it it feel it's just so much better to be in an energized, well fueled body because there's still gonna be suffering because it was a twenty mile oh, race. Yes. Like it's still exactly. like, yes. like but you can you can you can a- you can actually like enjoy the suffering and not like suffer through the suffering, if that makes any sense at all. But there yeah. is a difference and when you are well fueled, you 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 learn and feel that difference finally for yourself, you know? I think it's hard to explain for someone who hasn't experienced it yet but yeah even the suffering of like running out of joy versus running out of fear from the standard like racing versus like racing out of fear of not winning and disappointing people versus racing out of yeah joy because I feel like a kid on a playground when I'm out on the trails and yeah that's where I should be racing Uh uh-huh thanks to inside tracker I can get insights and feedback on my blood biomarkers whenever I want to No more waiting for doctor's visits and them telling you you're fine. Instead, you are in control of your health with Inside Tracker. For 20% off any of their products, blood biomarker testing, DNA kit, inner age, head to InsideTracker.com and use the code RISEUP. Take your health into your own hands. Health, wellness, and fitness coaches, listen up. Practice Better is the all-in-one platform that I use to manage my business and my clients. From client scheduling and messaging, hosting sessions, taking notes, creating modules, invoicing, telehealth, building reports, and more, Practice Better is the better way to manage your practice as a nutrition or health or fitness coach. Look no further. Use the link in our show notes and use the code RISEUP20 for 20% off your first four months plus a 14-day free trial. I've been using Practice Better since the inception of my business, Rise Up Nutrition, and I couldn't be happier. Again, the code is RISEUP20, all caps. Use the link in our show notes for 20% off your first four months and a 14-day free trial. Let's get back to the episode. That's actually something I try to remind myself and my clients of is to make sure that the exercise or sport you're doing, that it's playful. Like if you can kind of keep the, I like that it resonates with me to be like, this is fun. This is playing. Yeah. It's a word that's resonated with me quite a bit. A few other things that you said, Heidi, that I just want to touch on is how you wanted to recover from your eating disorder and like, and then win and like come out on top. And that would be your story of, Hey, when you recover, you know, you're going to be better. You're going to be the better athlete. And like, and I think that a lot of people want that. And maybe it can happen. And maybe it's some, for some people it does happen. 
And like at first it sounds good and encouraging and motivating, but I think the root problem of that is setting an expectation of recovery. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's like, I, I would, I, I want to motivate my clients too and say, Hey, when you do recover from your eating disorder, you will be a better athlete because I actually do 100% hands down know that to be true. You will be a better athlete if you do not struggle with an eating disorder. Yeah. Um, and if you can overcome you got it. gas in the tank, you got gas in the tank, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen right away. Again, it could for some people it does. And I know mm -hmm. for other people go through it and, and it doesn't happen for them. Then we're very envious and jealous of the person that it did happen mm -hmm. for, you know, but it's like, I, we just, we can't set that expectation throughout recovery of what the journey is going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. Another little thing you reminded me of just in like your epiphany that, Hey, I can race just to race, not to win. Mm -hmm. Growing up, my dad loved cycling and like always watched the Tour de France and things like that. And he had this poster in his bedroom. And I have, I can't believe after all these years that I don't know who said this quote, but it was a cycling poster. Yeah. And it said, the thrill is not just in winning, but in the courage to join the race. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of like, I, oh, love, I love that, that. quote. I grew up with it for you know 20 years and now I yeah. can't believe I don't know who said it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what you're saying. And, and yeah, the thrill is not just in winning, but in the courage to join the race that you had the courage to just jump in that 20 mile yeah. race. You also had the courage to say, Hey, I don't need to win this. I can just do it for me. Yeah. And that did take courage. And, and then you enjoyed your experience and that was the thrill. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was actually supposed to race uh, the Gorge Waterfalls 50K this past spring in April and then ended up with a stress reaction in my first metatarsal in like a month out from the race. Mm -hmm. So I had to, had to pull out. But my therapist and I, you know, kind of talked about, okay, like I kind of wanted, like I wanted to toe the line again at, at an ultra, knowing also that there was a lot, a lot there from like a disordered eating, disordered relationship with exercise, et cetera standpoint and needing to tread lightly with that experience and decide, okay, what are my motivations to doing this? Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure that I can do this successfully and come out the backside without having triggered something? And so we decided on this theme of curiosity and just like being curious about like what my body could do and chilling up on the day. And even though I didn't get to do that race, curiosity has since become very much a theme. Mm -hmm. I think just in general with my relationship with, yeah, like my body and movement and exercise, you know, all those different types of things. And it kind of goes along with, you know, that idea of like having the courage to get in the race. And it's just like, I just, I'm, I've always also been like a curious person. I'm a science nerd. And so being curious, which is also why I love nutrition, right? It's just this like giant puzzle and you get to be curious about your own body and applying the science to it. And and so I think that's also been something that I've tried to really, especially in my relationship with different types of exercise, post eating disorder treatment is keeping that theme of like curiosity and even just being able to check with myself about like, well, why, like, what would feel good to my body today? And like, well, why do I want to do this? Is it to burn calories? Is it, you know, to connect with a friend? Is it to like process some stuff is it you know is it because I you know want that like feeling of being playful and yeah so I think like that's also been a really powerful you know mantra if you will for me I think especially really over the past like six to eight months as I continue to navigate you know this trust with my body and yeah. movement and different types and that kind of thing well, and even that statement right there of as you navigate trust with your body, your theme is being curious, right? Because I think it's not, it's definitely not as easy as just saying, I trust my body. It's not this <laughs> light switch we turn on or off, but it's kind of the, the daily practice of being curious yeah. and, and asking yourself questions. Going back to what we said earlier of like, you might still have some intrusive thoughts or body insecurities, but if you stay you know, continue forward on the behaviors that you know keep you in a good, healthy, strong place. That's a turning point in your recovery. And I think for a long time, it is 
good to set the expectation that throughout recovery, you're just going to be questioning yourself. Yeah. And that questioning yourself doesn't, yeah. doesn't mean that you don't know the answer. It's just like a good practice. Yeah, for sure. I actually did it myself the other night because it was, was it Saturday or Friday night? One of the two. And I went out for a run at like 845 at night. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know what, Lindsay, you could just call it a night go to bed, you know, like, you know, yeah. and, but I also like, I really wanted to, but as I was out there, I was, I was asking myself just like, what is my motivation for doing this run right now? Yeah. Is it to burn calories? Is it because I'm not at my pre-baby weight yet? Is it, you know, is it because I need control because I feel mm, very out of control yeah, in my life right sure. now? And, you know, I had to, I answered on the run. I probably yeah. should have yeah. answered yeah. them before yeah. the run, if I'm being okay. completely honest. But the run helped me process it. Yeah. But it was just, to me, even the fact that I was, I was quality checking myself, yes. you know, and what I found to be true in that instance, just to give our listeners the, the result here. <laughs> um, roll. I know it, it was not to burn calories. It it was a little bit for control or more so I think stress relief, but I allowed myself to walk because I'm not in great fitness right now. Yeah. And I was okay with that because what I needed to do was just get out of the house and have time for myself. And so it was like, ah, I, I was kind of towing that line of like, for sure. I need to run to find control in my life, even though like that's not what it was really going to do, but it was like me time. But anyways, long drawn out story to just relate to you on that questioning yourself, questioning what are my motives? What are my intention? And get curious about it. And you will learn so much about yourself when you do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you really... Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, you just learn so much about how you think and why you do the things that you do. And I just, yeah, when it comes to that, I think that what you said of how you're just still getting curious about yourself is so important in this journey. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really good point. And I think maybe one of, I think, yeah, one of the maybe confusing parts about recovery or places where people can sometimes overthink things is maybe the idea of, you know, we talk about how exercise, whatever form of exercise or movement is your jam is a form of like stress relief. And But, and I think that eating disorder, you know, exercise addiction space, there's a little bit of shaming of that, of like, exercise shouldn't be therapy. You know, are you numbing your emotions? Are you like escaping something or running away? You know, that kind of emotional coping or or whatever. Mm -hmm. The same idea with like a salad. Salads are automatically like that is eating disorder thing. Not, that's not really how it is, but I think I definitely felt this way and felt I had to check myself and I've had athletes say the same thing of like, like in your example, no, you don't want to like always run when you're feeling like running should not just be this way to like cope and numb. Yeah. But sometimes it is okay for exercise to be that outlet. Mm -hmm. Also, if I go to a restaurant and a salad they have on the menu looks good I can get a salad if it is what I authentically want. It doesn't mean that's a disorder of thought. Exactly. But that also is where that curiosity comes from, right? Of like being able to check, have that check with yourself. Like, okay, historically for me, getting salads was disordered. But today, when I look at everything on the menu, this sounds delicious. Like this is what I want. For me, the bike trainer was the same thing. Like I used to race bikes and the bike trainer was a very much a disordered calorie burn type type of activity. And so I really tried to stay away from it for a long time post treatment. And more recently I've been dealing with this ultimate like a a knee issue, like a knee now it's my turn to not be able to think of the word. My kneecap never fully formed when I was oh. like born. And then I had a wow. soccer injury in high school where a piece of the kneecap actually broke off. So I've had like a broken kneecap for past, I don't know, 20 years, wow, 18 years, something like that. And it's been mostly manageable, kind of running over time has made it more aggravated, end up getting had a platelet rich plasma done on it uh, in July, which is where they take my blood out and spin it down and then put it back into the knee. Wow, crazy. Anyway, so I'm working with a physical therapist on building up my quad strength, especially my right, my right quad to help with like offload my knee. And especially as I was coming back, from, you know, my metatarsal injury. And then, you know, we couldn't like load my kneecap a ton. 
cycling, especially like really high resistance stuff was a really good way to work on quad strength. And the best way to do that was get on a trainer. And so it was really cool for me to be able to take this form of exercise that used to be a pure punishment and pure disorder to be something that I'm actually like intentional about being like functional, getting me to a place where like, I am just like a stronger, healthier human that will allow me to do what I want to do. And I can take away all the rules that I used to have on the bike trainer. Like I can hop on the trainer and do a couple high resistance sets and get off. I don't have to warm up or cool down or be on there for a certain amount of time or burn X number of calories. So it's been really cool with that to see that relationship change. But same thing, like I had to be really intentional going into it about being curious and saying, okay, like, why am I getting on the trainer? Yeah. What is this going to look like? How can I make sure that it doesn't become something that I don't want it to become? And so it does, I think. And that's, I think that's one of the, the hardest parts about eating disorder recovery in general is, and not to say that other addictions are easy. That's definitely not what I'm saying. But with so many, whether it's, you know, alcohol or drugs or gambling, oftentimes the point is like removal of the substance or removal you know, stepping away from the people that you used to do the thing with. Yeah. But eating disorder, like eating disorder treatment, you have to face your addiction and disorder all day, every day for the rest of your life. And that exposure therapy is exhausting. It is exhausting. And I think, I think that's one of the reasons why eating disorder recovery is so hard and why the nonlinear component, it's not just well a 12 step program. And it's, yeah, it's just so, so non- linear and it is also something that society ultimately glorifies right of like Mm -hmm. you know the different diets and you know the body ideals and that kind of thing and so yeah it's just I think having that like open dialogue and getting that out there whether it's social media or like yeah podcast stuff or you know when I'm working with my athletes I am so transparent and really want them to know that but like this is going to be non-linear and that is okay that's how it should be it doesn't mean you're failing you know being curious is important like and everybody's trajectory is so different and so it's so easy to get caught up in that comparison right of somebody else's recovery versus yours or just any of the other ways that we compare our bodies our food etc yeah anyway yeah super super helpful Heidi and I think just, again, I think a, a really good expectation of recovery because one other thing I wanted to hit on was earlier in the conversation, you mentioned how much less anxiety you have now and how, mu- how much more free you feel mentally. At the same time, there's still a lot of mental work in there mm. of quality checking yourself and being well, curious. But it's such a shift, right? It's not this like, I'm constantly thinking and stressed about food and body. And it's more of a, okay, I'm asking myself these questions, but in just much more of a light, positive, out of curiosity in a more playful manner. And so I think that's, I think that's a good differentiation too, because yes, for sure. You will, in order to relieve yourself of the constant thinking about food, you still have to think about food just in a very different way, yeah, right? Sure. And sometimes it's that process of how to think about food differently. That's that's the key, really. It's not that you just stop thinking about food and exercise and body altogether. It's that you think about it differently. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I think you really shed light on on that in your own journey. Heidi, I think I could probably talk to you for a couple more hours. <laughs> we can do for the- you. Yeah, we might have to, honestly, because uh, as I shared with you before we hit record, my guest list is running low as I've had very little time to work lately. So maybe we will do part two, but just just in case, because I I do have to wrap this up and get back to Levi, but just just in case it takes us a couple of weeks or something to do part two, (laughs) I would love for you to just share with our listeners you know, how you work with clients, name of your business, you work virtually, correct? Like just share a little bit of blurb there just so they know if if they really want to learn more about you and social media, you're on Instagram, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, my practice, Heidi Strickler Nutrition or Heidi Strickler Sports and Performance Nutrition, you can find me under both names. Started my practice just at the start of pandemic, actually before it started with the plan of it being virtual. So that was- That worked out. Godsend, very lucky on, on that front. So yeah, my practice is virtual. I'm based in Seattle, but most of my work is via Zoom. I do meet, if I have local athletes, we will meet in person sometimes for just our follow-up sessions or for like the challenge meal sessions that I offered where I'll eat together with my athletes. I also do grocery store game plans with local athletes where we'll go shopping together. But 
but yeah, so work uh, one-on-one with athletes I specialize in endurance and mountain athletes, female bodied athletes do a lot with nutrition and the menstrual cycle. And then any, you know, athletes struggling with kind of any spectrum of reds, disordered eating, disorder, lost their period, amenorrhea, that type of thing. And I have a variety of different packages and service services just kind of to fit each the individual needs of each person. And then I also do presentations both in person and virtually. So I contract with a couple of different universities and a lot of local high schools and we'll also present teams. I'm going to be talking with a youth Nordic, Nordic club, kind of Pacific Northwest club yeah. in the next couple of months. And I recently started incorporating catering into my services. I love to cook and cooking is definitely a love language for me. And so it's been fun to start working some running retreats and running camps and incorporate kind of my love for cooking with kind of just culinary knowledge and yeah. um, being able to apply sports nutrition principles to that. So yeah, you can find me on Instagram <laughs> as much as I think maybe it would increase my visibility to get on something like TikTok. I can't get myself to do it. Me so neither. Me neither. Instagram, I know. Instagram only. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then <laughs> that's already too much. Yeah. And then I am in the process of building my website. So I'll be launching oh. that this fall as well as a couple support groups. So I'm going to be launching a coach support group, parent support group, and athlete support group over the course of the next couple of months, which will involve like a Slack channel kind of community as well as kind of one-on-ones with me, um, or sorry, group video sessions with me. So that's all the, all the pots. Love it. That I, Love that it. I'm doing right now. Yeah. It was super exciting to see again, professionally too, like kind of the, the growth and mm-hmm. all the things, all the ideas and ways that you're supporting people. So it's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Well, Heidi, thank you. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot the questions I do at the, the end questions. of every. Yes, I have to ask you the questions. The okay, questions. Okay. If there's one food you could eat every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would it be? This is hard because, like, all of my favorite food. I mean, I do eat them most days, and I don't get sick <laughs> of them. Like peanut butter, Greek yogurt, tacos, coffee, ice cream. Like I eat. Like I, I could eat them every day. I was thinking about this though, and I think maybe yeah. one that isn't on that list of things I literally do slash could eat every day. Yeah. But maybe I would like to be able to. My girlfriend's tiramisu is like mm. next level mind blowing. Mm. And so that maybe would be on the list. Yeah. Okay. Love it. I know. I, I'm always like, well, I do drink coffee every day. Yeah. So is that my answer? But yeah, I let's every day or like, I, yeah, it's just, yeah, like, let's so. have more fun with it. Yeah. Yes. Tiramisu that would homemade be one that, like, tiramisu. Yes. I don't eat every day, but would like but to and not get sick of it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite sport to participate in yourself? Trail running. No question. I recently started playing pickleball or played pickleball for the first time. I didn't understand the hype. Oh, yeah, that's like a very trendy thing right now. Yeah. It's really fun. Like <laughs> I could definitely get into some pickleball, but yeah, yeah trail running. Just saw a girl at the airport the other day with a sweatshirt that just said pickleball across the <laughs> front of it. And I was like, yeah. this is such a thing suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but awesome. Okay. And what's your favorite sport to be a spectator of? Women's soccer. No question. Yeah. It was my yeah. first love. I played since I was three and it will always be like a big part of big part of who I am. So I love watching the game. Awesome. And then a female athlete out there that you want to give a shout out to for being an inspiration, a role model in any way, shape or form, who would that be and why? Can I have two? Of course. Okay. (laughs) We're not going to limit you on how many female athletes we want to uh, lift up. (laughs) Awesome. So one would be Amelia Boone. Yeah. I think, like I said earlier in the podcast, like she, her openness about her journey with reading disorder and recovery was really like, I still, I can still remember like where I was when I heard her podcast for the first time. And I just resonated so much with so much of what she said. And she went to Opal Food and Body, which is here in Seattle. And hearing her story and her journey was the first time I ever considered giving myself the permission or the recognition that I might need treatment. And so, I mean, that changed the trajectory of my life and has then obviously since like changed the trajectory of thousands of other lives as well. And it's that gift that keeps on giving. So hundred percent Amelia Boone, just also for her continued transparency with eating disorder recovery. It's not easy to do to be vulnerable like that on social media. So that's a big one. And then I think the other one is 
I've got a few, I run with a local kind of trail running group out here in Seattle or over in Issaquah. And I think really over the past eight, well, since my injury, the beginning of March, so whatever that is, six months, mm-hmm. there are a few women in that group who just really, and I will cry, like really made it apparent that I was not just someone that they ran with mm. and that they love me for who I am outside of the fact that we just run together. And friendships have been something that I've struggled with for a lot of my adult life, just because of some like friendship relationship, little T trauma stuff when I was in high school and college and post collegiately. And so to have those people like make time intentionally to like, do coffee or go to the dog park or go for walks when I couldn't because I was injured and I couldn't couldn't connect with running you know my friend one of them is my friend Corinne she was like we can talk when we run we can talk when we have coffee too yeah and it's just like some such a simple gesture but yeah so I think I would just like to shout out yeah small group of of those women I'm I'm sure they all know who they are that just really showed me what true friendship is. And that's, I think, something that's really special. I love, so shout out to Amelia Boone and to your friends in the running group for being more than just friends in the running group. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. and I think that's, I've heard this from so many people and clients and definitely I've experienced it myself that we feel like, oh, when we're not in our running group or we're not on the team because of an injury, we feel so left out socially. Mm-hmm. And yep. it's, you know, if you are the person who isn't injured, like, if you can, yeah, meet meet that person for coffee. Go yeah. watch a movie together. You yeah, know, go little, hang little out because yeah, it goes such a long way. And I, yeah. yeah, that's such a good reminder for our listeners. So thank you for that. Yeah, of course, thank you. Well, Heidi, I think very similar to what Amelia Boone did for you. I want to thank you for your vulnerability and openness and honesty in your journey and what you've gone through and are still going through because. As you already said, the gift that keeps giving. I know this conversation today, very powerful and helpful for people and the work that you're doing with others and and the openness and honesty that you have in the work that you do is just beautiful, really beautiful. So thank you for that. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah, for your for your podcast as well. It's it's a gift. Well, everybody, thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, if you are a true fan of female athlete nutrition, then I would love if you could support our podcast by spreading the word, share a review on your listening channel, give us five stars. It really helps get the word out and get the show more views to positively impact others. Also, you can support the podcast by joining our Patreon Head to patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition to consider a donation or even better, join our membership where you get extra monthly content and perks. We don't want you to simply listen alone. We want you to be a part of a community and a movement of fierce, fit, and fueled female athletes. So patreon.com slash female athlete nutrition is where you can do exactly that, learn more, and join. A huge thanks to our affiliates and partners as well. Once again, Prevenix, Inside Tracker, or Gain, Practice Better, Jen and Carrie. Please go check them out and their links in the show notes where you can get deals and discounts. Last, be sure that you do more than just listen. If you need help with fueling, it's time to take action. Head to my website to learn more. You can either book a free call with me to learn more about our coaching programs and how we can work directly with you, whether it's the fast track or otherwise, or you can take our online self-study course, Female Athlete Nutrition. You can literally sign up and gain access right now. You can explore our downloadable products, including the Red S Recovery Guide, High Iron Fueling Guide. Or if you are a coach of a team, check out our brand new coaches toolkit for teams. You can also just learn more. We have a blog, a Red S quiz to see if Red S is affecting you. If you need help, I want you to get help fast. Too many girls and athletes struggle with nutrition, but you don't have to any longer. You can rise up with the power of nutrition, take action today in any of these avenues, and become fierce, fit, and fueled. Links in the show notes, and we'll see you next time.